Lee, thank you very much. Joining us here on Skype on the news hour from New York City is uh, Vincent Warren. He's a civil rights attorney and the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. Vincent Warren, welcome to Al Jazeera. So, chokeholds have been outlawed. That is undoubtedly good news. But how durable will this legislation, can this legislation be, when it goes to the White House and is signed off, presumably, and becomes law? Uh, there are a couple of pieces to this, Peter. Thing number one is that both the Democrats and the Republicans are missing the point of this moment. And while I think the Democrats are trying to move forward some reforms around accountability and things like that, the, the moment they're, they're missing is that what people are calling for is centering the experience of black people with the police killed, murdered, beaten, maimed for generations. Uh, in fact, I was involved in a chokehold case 30 years ago. 30 years from now uh, ago, we had this discussion. We're still having it now. So the reforms are important, but they're not the whole thing. If we were centering uh, the black experience, we, the, they would be talking about things like um, in cities like Chicago, in cities like Detroit, there are more police in schools than there are school counselors in schools. That's what the defund and abolition movement is about. It's about shifting the resources so that we are not stuck in black communities with having the entity that's going to respond to the social challenges that we have being the police department. And that relates to, um, I think, the hard part about getting this legislation passed. I think the Democrats are on the right track but have it largely wrong because they don't want to talk about an important thing like defunding the police from the perspective of the black communities. The Republicans seem to be hell-bent on saying if we get rid of the police, we're going to have chaos in the streets, which is not true. You just have to look at a place like Camden, New Jersey. Jersey, where they dismantled their police department and the crime rate went down, or even in New York City when my organization uh, won a case against stop and frisk in New York City, and while the mayor and everybody and the police said that the crime rate was going to shoot up, it actually went down. So with those two problems, I have no, uh, I, there's no doubt in my mind that the president is going to use this as a political uh, prong to, to boost his base and push back against it. The more we talk about how Black Lives Matter and how the police are being brutal, the more the president is going to talk about how police matter and that if we get rid of the police, it's going to be chaos. OK, when you talk there, Vincent, about what we're seeing at the moment being part of the thing, what is, in your mind, the whole thing? Or to ask you the question in a different way, what is the force here? Break it down for us, because if you've got someone like John Lewis, you know, who knows about these things, saying he is stunned, he is amazed, because he's never seen so many white people walking cheek by jowl with so many black people and people of color. So that's a problem, and that's why you end up, can I suggest to you, with a US president walling himself into the White House. Yes, the, the force that's happening on the street is exactly that. And it's mirrored around the world, in London, in Paris, um, in, in South Korea, um, there was a protest. That what we're seeing is that um, folks are rallying to the support of black people, listening to black people's experience and saying this has to stop. That is a massive, massive force. And the only thing that the president has going for him is his base, uh, which is relatively small but powerful in the United States, and the narrative that if we don't continue to invest in police departments, black people are going to kill white people. That's essentially what the discussion is. And um, it's, it's never subtle with him, although he's being a little bit more subtle now than usual. Uh, um, but I think the end of, at the end of the day, what people are beginning to realize is that the only reason why law enforcement exists to this day, to the extent that it does, is to the extent that people can continue to convey a, narr a narrative of criminality amongst black people. So the idea that someone like George Floyd, Floyd, everybody in Congress is going to say that was a horrible thing, but nobody in Congress is going to say that that is endemic and systemic and has been happening for many, many years on and off video. Okay. And that becomes a problem that we have to resolve systemically and not just with uh, policy reform. Are you, however, saying that there's a chance that the legislation I mean, surely, Vincent, it can't, it can't say go the same, the, the same way as the Brady Bill. You know, um, the closest that your critics would say, the critics of the U.S. would say, the closest the U.S. has ever got to meaningful gun control legislation died in committee. It, it was talked literally to death 
in committee, so you didn't get gun control legislation, meaningful gun control legislation on the books with the Brady Bill. Um, are you saying that this legislation may actually go no place, if only because, you mentioned the election there, if only because Mr Biden is largely associated with legislation in the 1990s, which is part of the backstory of the negativity and the narrative that we're experiencing right now? We have a... The critiques of the United States are absolutely valid, valid particularly around gun control. And they're also valid, particularly about, around anti-black racism and how it's expressed through law enforcement. In our country, we essentially are trying to uh, pull ourselves out of our own punitive instinct. We solve every problem, particularly in this administration. The first uh, uh, action is militarism. The second action is law enforcement. And we double down on that. That is a problem for our relationship in the world, as uh, folks on Al Jazeera will know. That is a problem for our relationship in the United States with each other, and particularly for black and brown people in the United States. I don't feel confident that this, uh, uh, that this Congress will be able to move forward a meaningful bill without watering it down with compromise, um, because we're not wrestling with the fundamental question. If you think about gun control, it's an easy answer, but it gets complicated because of the interests the gun lobby interests, the uh, narratives around um, the Second Amendment and your right to bear arms, that complicates it. And it makes it feel like a step forward, which would be eliminating guns, or a step forward, which would be like reducing and eliminating um, uh, police departments that are, are violent and that are uh, seizing in, in black communities. Okay. It makes those things feel like, they're, that it, like a loss rather than a win. And that's the problem that we have. Very briefly, Vincent, I mean, history always bends, it always arcs like light around a star towards justice, ultimately. If you and I have this conversation again on November the 4th, will you be saying to me that your president, re-elected president perhaps, Donald Trump is on the right side of history or not? When we have this conversation on November the 4th, 20 years from now, you and I will be wondering and marveling how we ever allowed the police to act the way that we did, because we will have abolished and changed the structure of law enforcement. November 4th is a much shorter arc, and I think that the path to the presidency is a very small waypoint on the, in the arc of history. President Trump will be on the wrong side of it. My concern is that the Democrats and the rest of the population will be pushing towards the right side of it. Vincent, really good to talk to you. Thank you so much for giving us your insight here on the News Hour. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate it.